Okay, uh, welcome everybody to this week's uh, Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. Very, very special uh, symposium this week and I'm super excited about it. Um, so uh, just for some quick introductions before we get to tonight's speaker, my name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the neurosurgeons here at the University of Miami, uh, focusing on brain tumor skull base and uh, director of our research program. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Morcos, who's professor and co-chairman of our uh, department, as well as the director of cerevascular and skull base. Uh, Dr. Komatar is a professor and program director of our residency program, also the director of the UMBTI and surgical neuro-oncology, and Dr. Benjamin, who's assistant professor, also a specialist in brain tumors and director of our skull base laboratory. Uh, each week we put this on, this is our 22nd session. We've been going since April, um, and we couldn't do this without the help of our great administrative team from both the University of Miami Department of Neurosurgery and the Sylvester Comprehensive Camper Cancer Center. Thank you so much to Christina, Roberto, Ingrid, and Ignacio. Uh, if, if for anybody who wants to learn more about our symposiums or our department here at the University of Miami, you can always find us on social media or our website. Uh, we're on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, all these sessions are recorded, and if you miss any, uh, you can always find them on our YouTube channel. Uh, in conjunction with the Brain Tumor Symposium on Wednesdays, uh, which happens the same time every week, uh, we also have a cerebrovascular and skull base symposium that happens on Thursdays from 5 to 7. And uh, tomorrow we have a, a great set of speakers talking about uh, pituitary adenomas with uh, Dr. Oyusiku and Dr. Velutini uh, talking about technique results and lessons learned. Um, I'm sure this is going to be a great uh, symposium with some great panelists, so be sure to tune in tomorrow night for that as well. And a quick teaser for next week, we'll be uh, joined uh, from the United Kingdom from Dr. Semendoras uh, to talk about a uh, journey to the center of the brain on pineal and third ventricular tumors. So uh, please be sure to, to join us again next week. Some housekeeping, uh, all participants, uh, we try to make this as interactive as possible. After Dr. Stoop is, is done uh, talking tonight, uh, we'll be trying to get to everybody's questions. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll, we'll, we'll talk to them about those. Also, uh, we don't offer any CME, but you will get an email confirm uh, confirming your, your participation. And please be sure to like, follow, and share our videos on uh, social media so that we continue to grow and share the fantastic knowledge of all of our speakers. So this week, uh, we have a great set of panelists, uh, starting with uh, Dr. Uh, Plakantanakis, uh, joining us from NYU, Associate Professor of Neurosurgery, uh, a mem member of the Lauren Isaac Pomatter Cancer Center, and the Kimmel Center for Stem Cell Biology. He's one of the investigators in the Neuroscience Institute and director of the Embryonic Stem Cell Research Oversight Committee, as well as the Neurosurgical Laboratory for Stem Cell Research. Uh, Dr. Prieto, uh, who's one of our uh, neuro-oncologists here at the University of Miami in the several, uh, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, part of our neuro-oncology neuro and neuroimmunology program. And I'll be filling in for Dr. Zachariah, who had a last minute case and couldn't join us. Uh, and you guys know who I am. Uh, this week, we really, it's, it's really my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Stoop. Uh, he really doesn't need an, an introduction. He's probably the most world-renowned uh, and recognized neuro-oncologist in the world. Um, he's currently at Northwestern, where he acts as uh, the director of uh, the, the brain tumor uh, program. Uh, he's the chief of neuro-oncology in the Department of Neurosurgery. He's the Paul Busey Professor of Neurosurgery. Um, he has uh, titles in neurosurgery, medicine, and neurology. He's also the associate director for strategic initiatives at the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. Prior to joining Northwestern, Dr. Soup was a professor in oncology at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Um, and um, uh, since 2006, he served on the board of European Organization for Research and Treatment of Cancer, or the ERTC. Uh, and in 2012 to 2017, he was the president. He also was a section editor during this time of the European Journal of Cancer. Uh, he has too many honors and awards and publications to, to kind of talk about all of them today, but I will mention he did receive the European Society of Medical Oncology Hamilton Farley Award and the Society for Neuro-Oncology Victor Levin Award, two of the most uh, prestigious awards for neuro-oncology. Uh, he currently is an uh, active and dedicated researcher for both primary and secondary malignancies at Northwestern, and he's a key part of the Northwestern uh, Brain Tumor Spore Program, which is one of only 11 in the country. Um, and you can't talk about Dr. Stoop without talking about his landmark contributions for glioblastoma. Of course, his paper in 2005, 
here in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, talking about the chemotherapy and radiation uh, treatment plan for glioblastoma. And then more recently with his paper on, on tumor treating fields for glioblastoma, really uh, the only two FDA approved uh, uh, treatments for glioblastoma that we use and have made such a difference in the field um, and, and, and such an icon in this disease. So um, I'm just so honored and privileged to, to introduce him today and, and feel very lucky that he gets to talk to us about glioblastoma and his thoughts on this topic. So Dr. Stoop, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Ivan, for this uh, very kind words of introduction. I hardly recognize myself and uh, I apologize for the many titles. I'm not sure, is it is already sharing my screen? I don't think so. No, if you could just reshare it, that'd be great. Let's see, let's get back to that. I thought by now we have it all figured out, but it's, it's a pleasure to be among you. Of course, uh, I think two or three years ago, I was down in Miami, that was uh, more fun when you could directly interact. I can't even say interrupt, um, but uh, please uh, write down the questions so we can discuss. The, these are the obligatory, uh, disclosures, although I don't think I have anything that is really relevant to today. Um, very briefly, what are the challenges when we talk on glioma? And I'm going to focus on glioma, and I cannot talk on every one of the challenges, but I will really address very briefly that we have to do with an infiltrative disease, the migratory potential, and the, the blood-brain barrier, and how to overcome those. Um, on Migration and proliferation, this is not really new. And I think that's what I was alluding to in my title. Everything is new and not so new. So this is work we know, you know, on the left side, the seminal works by Walter Dandy and others uh, going this very uh, aggressive hemispherectomy and so on and not being able to really cure the disease. And then a very good review article by uh, Gies and Björkvik um, in uh, 2003 in the JCO, what it means in brain tumors and this migratory potential. This just to say that with surgery alone, by local treatment alone, we will not be able to have a full curative impact on this disease. To illustrate that in work that Craig Hobinski has been piloting and really something we're not doing so much anymore these days is doing autopsies, and this is out of an autopsy series, um, just showing that we actually see in a great number of patients when we do autopsy that not, we don't see anything necessarily on the MRI, but we see brainstem infiltration. So the tumor cells have to go there, and probably the brainstem is uh, purely by gravity that the cells move along gravity. Maybe they're also specific pathways. These are things to be uh, alluded to and worked on in the future. We've done trials trying to inhibit migration, um, but those have failed and here namely uh, like selengitide, that was the idea behind. Then surgery, and I'm not gonna belabor surgery with all those renowned and expert surgeons among us. Um, as a disclaimer, I'm just a simple medical oncologist um, and you have better technologies, you have fluorescent, you have 5-ALA to do better surgeries, but this alone will also not, will improve somewhat outcome, but it's part of a global strategy and that's what I wanna get to. Um, nevertheless, yes, surgery, and this is the most recent paper out of uh, UCSF showing the value of surgery, of course, there will never be a randomized trial on the extent of surgery, uh, yes or no, but this is very valuable because they really looked at it with the eyes of modern classification, and I come into modern classification just on the next slide, IDH mutation, MGMT methylation, and all uh, what really matters very much So in the natural history. So not all glioblastoma, not all tumors are alike, even if they have and carry the same diagnosis. In brief on pathology, what I was alluding to, what you see on the left upper uh, corner is some of the mutations we knew and how the classification 
would go with primary and secondary and grade two, three, and four. And now I think most important when we talk about glioma, is it IDH wild type or is it IDH mutated? All oligos are IDH mutated, and then we have the diffuse astrocytoma with an IDH mutation, but also secondary GBMs that have an IDH mutation. While we still have the grading uh, between uh, grade three anaplastic astrocytoma and grade four GBM, but this has become much less relevant. Um, MGMT as a predictive marker for response to alkylating agent, I'm not going to talk about today. You know that this has been there for since 2005, and slowly we accept it also to take it into strategic decisions when we want to withhold treatment with, MG, with temozolomide for unmethylated patients in favor of novel strategies. Um, but what I want to just highlight that there are, when you have an anaplastic astrocytoma grade three tumor, if it has an EGFR amplification, or it has chromosome seven gain and chromosome 10 loss, uh, or a TERT mutation, these are tumors that should be considered like glioblastoma. And they are now to be called um, diffuse astrocytic glioma with molecular features of glioblastoma. This is out of work that is done by a panel of expert neuropathologists, but together with clinicians and others to really um, try to see how we make progress in between uh, the WHO classification updates. And it's called C-IMPACT NOW Consortium for uh, Molecular, to inform on molecular and practical approaches to CNS taxonomy. And the now means, yes, of course, you want to do it now and not wait for the WHO, but it's not an official WHO classification yet. Then when we talk about radiation, which is another mainstay modality, um, just to highlight, we talk about radiation, we compare among trials, we talk about dosing, but across the globe, the radiation guidelines are not exactly the same. European guidelines are different than uh, the US guidelines. The US guidelines are larger fields of radiation, but when at least we looked at it in trials we have done across the Atlantic Ocean uh, between European patients and US patients, there was no difference in outcome. So again, we couldn't belabor that for a long time. Uh, I think even within the US, there are big differences. I know of US centers who go more by the more restrictive European guidelines. Of course, the size of the radiation field, the location plays a role. And when you look at clinical trials, it's actually shocking how little is reported, including my own trial, on tumor location or even tumor size. Not that the size probably by itself matters that much, but it matters with the location on the radiation field, on cognitive, uh, consequences of treatment on late toxicity. And hopefully as we get better with treatment, this will matter more. Um, new radiation techniques. Um, so we have gone from standard cobalt radiation, whole brain radiation, to focal radiation, to IMRT. And now more and more, and I know you have it down in uh, Miami, proton beam, pencil beam, even more precise radiation. But does it really help in the field of uh, malignant glioma remains to be determined. As I mentioned, it is an infiltrative disease, so that high uh, precision may or may not be needed. Um, in lower grade glioma, there is at least hints that you would have better uh, outcome, uh, less uh, cognitive decline. Um, that this is one series out of uh, the Harvard group. Uh, MGH, with a small number of patients, they followed over four or five years. Again, the median follow-up is fairly short and felt that they had over five years um, cognitively stable situation. Again, in favorable tumors. And I think here there is something surely to look into. And I think especially in lower grade glioma, the long-term survival and the cognitive decline is an, uh, an issue we have to address 
uh, thing we did not really worry that much 20 years ago. NRG, so that's a former RTOG now called Energy, is running randomized trials. Um, there is two trials I just want to highlight with protons. Uh, one is exactly in these uh, low-grade glioma, BN005, looking at randomizing photon radiation with, versus proton radiation, followed by temozolomide afterwards in both arms. And primary endpoint is really cognition with a complex score of um, numerous cognitive tests that need to be done prospectively. Now, it's a complex trial. Again, to do it multicentric with a complicated uh, panel and array of uh, cognitive tests takes some logistics and again, collaboration. But I think it's gonna be a very important trial. Now, the challenge is this trial to really mature will take many, many years. Um, so we have to make sure that we follow these patients carefully after treatment is over, not only for survival, but also for cognitive decline. The other idea with protons is dose escalation. Does it allow to give higher doses? Um, overcome that? Now, this has been looked at, and so far, dose escalation has not really panned out in prior trials. But it was felt that dose escalation may have maybe some advantage, but again, all uncontrolled series. This is a series out of University of Michigan with Christine Etienne as first author when she was still there. Um, you don't even have molecular markers. It's very hard to make a conclusion. So one trial we're going into is again with NRG BN001 looking at the dose escalation. You see a very large trial, 567 patients. It's posted as a randomized phase two. I haven't looked up the detail of the protocol why it is a randomized phase two. And it has a reasonable statistics of going for a hazard ratio of 0.72. Just as a reminder, I think a hazard ratio of 0.7 is what you can hope to achieve. Everything more is a bonus. For temozolomide, we had at the end a hazard ratio of 0.63, and also for tumor treating fields, we had a hazard ratio of 0.63. But so I think uh, the statistics make sense. I think it's, uh, it's well designed. Uh, together with temozolomide, we'll see what is going to be happening. The slide I just jumped before was just a general um, reminder on pseudo progression. Um, this has been reported sometimes more frequent with protons. Whether this is true in this case or not remains to be determined. But uh, just remember, and this is even beyond three months, pseudo progression remains a challenge uh, when you do all the imaging. And so give the patient the benefit of the doubt if the patient is doing well and treat beyond your radiological progression if the general condition of the patient allows. And this is important, I think, most impact we have when we treat early on with the right thing, while actually second line treatments have never really provided a good effect. Um, so you don't withhold an active salvage treatment from somebody by treating a little longer. Then comes the blood brain barrier. And this just a couple of examples. This was a young lady um, showing some contrast enhancing tumor. But when you look at the T2, you see all of this uh, is tumor. This is done at the same time, it's the same images. So actually there is way more tumor extension than what we see. Even when we have more um, contrast enhancing, we can assume and we have to assume that there is tumor beyond what we see. And I think uh, that's where the challenge is. That's where in the Molinaro uh, slide at the beginning saying that actually supertotal resection, but even supertotal resection could never take care of this kind of extensive uh, invasion. And sometimes you just don't see it, but it's still there. 
So the blood-brain barrier may be one of the reasons that many of the drugs uh, didn't work. Um, and if I take a series and my list of negative trials is getting longer and longer, but all these drugs, including Vincristin, Selengitide, Nimutosumab, or Afatinib, these were agents we knew going into the trials that they do not sufficiently cross the blood-brain barrier. And most recently, Depatax M, ABT414, an anti-EGFR cytotoxic monoclonal antibody, we also know it's not crossing. Nevertheless, we've took, we have taken those agents into large randomized trials, and maybe we need to ask ourselves, is that really the right thing? So I cannot say that an EGFR inhibitor is not working in brain tumors, because if it never hits and the target, then actually we will never be able to make any conclusion whether the pathway is not right. So how could we overcome the blood-brain barrier? There have been ideas a long time ago, like gliadel wafers, who would uh, release cytotoxic agent within the brain. Um, this was BCNU, but probably both the concentration of the carmustin or BCNU was too low, too low. And also the penetration is not far enough. Then some of you uh, have said, okay, we as neurosurgeons can take care of that. We do it with convection enhanced delivery. Um, there is quite some challenge there between you need a higher pressure. Um, how do you get it really in there? and so on, what is the right catheter today has also not really panned out. Implantation of radioactive seeds is something that is coming back, uh, brachytherapy, but again, the extent of the x-ray without causing toxicity is probably a limiting factor. And then we have been medical opening of the blood-brain barrier or, or, or reversing the uh, peak glycoprotein um, export pumps in the tumor. So sometimes you need to think a little bit outside the box. So here you have uh, I different ideas I want to address with you. So one was, can we use ultrasound? And there is different ways. There's a very focused ultrasound. This is work with a, uh, coming from Toronto. Uh, using an ultrasound uh, machine with an MRI, uh, high intensity, very focused ultrasound, so uh, produced by InsightTech that could help for certain neurological disease. But this high precision will also not really address the question we have in the brain unless we can have that to a larger field. Or what Alexander Carpentier, uh, innovative neurosurgeon out of the PTS Salpetriere in Paris came up with, can I implant an ultrasound emitter? And can I access the ultrasound emitter from the outside? So what was done initially, just uh, implanting one single ultrasound emitter and then doing clinical trial with that. But one single ultrasound emitter is also too small of a field. But once this has been shown that this is safe and feasible, now we have a device that has nine ultrasound emitters that uh, could be implanted. Now it's invasive because it requires surgery. This will stay, this will be in a defect in the skull we have placed. That's how it would look like in the model. Uh, when you have the tumor, you would do it at the time you resect the tumor. Uh, it will uh, nicely cover up. You will access the device with a transdermal needle that would go in here that is then connected to the pulse generator. And in order to really open the blood-brain barrier, it's not only the ultrasound itself, it's the ultrasound in association at the same time of an IV administration of microbubbles. Microbubbles that will then, through the ultrasound being activated and mechanically uh, open up the blood-brain barrier. So you need to have the right dose, the right frequency, the right duration, so you don't do vascular damage. Um, and if you open the blood-brain barrier temporarily, so the protective effect of the blood-brain barrier is restored within six, eight, or 10 hours. That's how it looks like uh, 
in, intraoperatively. This is one of our patients. So Adam Sonam is the surgeon. So instead of the bone, we implant that. That will be then under, covered under the skin, but you could palpate it with your fingers, similar as you would do for a port -a cat device. And just to show you a couple of examples, this is a young patient who had uh, a recurrent IDH mutated tumor. The tumor was growing. Uh, this been uh, the baseline after resection of the tumor and implantation of the SonoCloud 9 device. And this has been about 30 minutes after sonication. While at baseline, you don't see any contrast enhancement, you start seeing gadolinium enhancement uh, shortly after sonication. And that's at the second sonication. And if you take this uh, sagittal view, um, you can see that actually sonication field can be fairly large. So the, or the opening of the blood brain barrier to a very a reasonably large area. This is another example of, uh, of a patient that's been before resection, after resection, and here again, about half an hour after sonication, you see opening the blood brain barrier. If you do an MRI with scatolinium at that time, you see everything lighting up. If I repeat uh, the MRI 48 or 72 hours afterwards, the gadolinium will disappear again. So that's all fine, but that's relative to what we have. We use the gadolinium as a relative measure of the blood brain barrier opening. So how much does it open the blood brain barrier and how big of molecules over what time will really uh, disseminate remains to be proven. So we have some gaps in knowledge. Uh, and I think one way is also to quantify. And we try to address that in a clinical trial I'm talking about in a moment. We are really, at the time, we would do a sonication intraoperatively to an area that has to, that is non-enhancing, that has to come out in order to get to the enhancing tumor. And we would look and specifically biopsy there, that tissue to then measure, measure drug combination. Now for the ongoing trial, it has been carboplatin. For our upcoming trial, we purposely use uh, abraxane. This is uh, albumin-bound paclitaxel or albumin-bound taxol. So a drug that is potentially toxic, that clearly is too large to normally cross the blood-brain barrier and try to assess how much we get there to then have a quantitative idea whether such an approach would really allow to study molecules that normally would not cross or even trap molecules. Um, safety, of course, is a concern. Uh, and so this is gonna be a phase one trial. Um, we start such a trial in recurrent disease, um, just as I have shown you, with the idea that ultimately, at some point when we have shown safety and feasibility, to uh, use it in the upfront setting, at least for some patients. So uh, you would get consent. We would have intraoperative uh, sonication only with one sonicator, look at biological endpoints, at tumor uh, changes of the tissue and uh, genetic uh, changes, upregulation of certain genes and uh, drug concentration. The beauty about this concept is that you can do it repeatedly. Um, with that implant that we could afterwards non-invasively through this, uh, trans with this transdermal needle, access the ultrasound device and treating in cycles the way we have established it in oncology for many diseases. And we have established actually for GBM also in, uh, with temozolomide. So this trial has, uh, just been approved, is uh, activated at Northwestern or is about to be activated in the next week or so, uh, so for the first patients to be treated. What are we gonna compare it with? It's gonna be a non-controlled trial. It's a 
phase one with an expansion cohort. So we need to look and compare it. At some point, we also want to know efficacy, not only safety. So the, what we will compare it to, to some extent, is the recently published tocogen trial or presented tocogen trial, which actually showed there has been no benefit of uh, TOCA 511 uh, with, uh, with repeat surgery. All those patients had repeat surgery. So this is a very good indicator what we can obtain in recurrent disease with best physician's choice chemotherapy uh, following initially uh, repeat surgery. So we get about 12 months. So we'll see what we get in our early phase trial to see whether this is a concept to take forward. You remember I said outside the box. So in the outside the box, what would come else? Um, tumor treating fields. I trust uh, we have talked about it before, but I still want to show briefly where we're going and what this concept does. So tumor treating fields where we have various mechanisms of action. There is also uh, at least some preclinical data that tumor treating fields will uh, increase permeability of uh, glioblastoma cells and therefore probably works best when you have it in combination with chemotherapy rather than just alone and it would allow for better penetration of the chemotherapy agents into the brain. And so this is a concept that has been advanced and work uh, that has uh, comes out of late Sanjeev Gambir's lab. Um, Shirak Patel, who was working uh, in his lab and is now faculty at Stanford, will this take this to the next level and further investigate that. You've seen how this works, how uh, you practic practically do it. Uh, you'll see that you, the device has become smaller and it can be really done. I think it's uh, feasible even for ladies. This lady didn't want to take it off after two years. That's about the duration that was investigated in the study. Where do we go from here as next steps? The next step would be with the idea of combining it with radiation early on because there is data not only for synergy with chemotherapy, but there is also preclinical data of potential synergy with radiation therapy to now evaluate it in the upfront setting. Um, so already starting it during radiation. The reason at the time that the trial was started and randomization was after chemo RT was that it would have been impossible to convince the radiation oncologist at the time to irradiate with the electrodes in place. Second, to have the electrodes placed and taken off um, for six weeks in a row on every day, I think for the skin may not be the best solution. So that has been another consideration why this was not uh, done at that time. And again, don't forget these trials were all designed 2006, seven. So it's been over a decade. So now I think uh, the company at least feels the time is ripe to start it in an upfront setting. And they have designed another large international trial uh, with up to a thousand patients to be randomized, looking for a difference in overall survival. Quite an ambitious trial also an ambitious uh, target or endpoint to improve overall survival uh, just by starting two months earlier. So it will be interesting to see. Um, my colleagues, uh, Achel Grossman and Tzvika Ram from uh, Israel, from Bellinson have shown that this can be done. So they have an ongoing trial. Uh, they have already included close to 60 patients looking at this that is feasible. So that's ongoing, that's on the horizon. What else is on the horizon? PARP inhibitors have been used and have been a come and go and had a somewhat of a renaissance. So basically interfering with the repair pathway 
in uh, glioma with PARP inhibition. And this works. This works in ovarian cancer. This works in uh, certain prostate cancer and BRCA uh, mutated tumors. So there has been some interest to combine that with temozolomide. And uh, Carrie McDonald and her team in Australia have done quite some good preclinical work showing that there would make sense to actually add and investigate viliparib in unmethylated tumors. They have presented the results about a year ago at SNOW, and as you can see, no difference in progression-free survival nor overall survival. Similarly, for the methylated ones, the Alliance Cooperative Group has taken this forward and has run a large randomized phase three trial uh, looking at adding viliparib to temozolomide um, after chemo radiation uh, during the maintenance phase. This trial has fully recruited and we are waiting for the results. So I think uh, by this time next year, we should probably have the results. Because it's the methylated patients, you need way longer follow-up than in the unmethylated until you can conclude. What else is out there? Immunotherapy, and of course, it's just impossible these days to talk and give a talk uh, on trends without mentioning immunotherapy. But is what is true for melanoma and lung cancer truly uh, also applicable to glioblastoma. Glioblastoma is a completely different disease, has a low mutational burden, uh, smoking will cause a lot of mutations, so will uh, melanoma with UV light. What about in uh, glioblastoma? This is not the case. And indeed, a trial uh, run through Bristol-Myers Squibb with 360 patients comparing in recurrent disease, nivolumab versus bevacizumab, um, there was no difference in outcome. This has just been published finally in May this year. Why it took three years to publish that? If this would have been a positive trial, it would have been coming up at the day of presentation. That's beyond what I understand. Now, sounds like that somebody at Bristol Myers must have heard me before when I was advocating that you should if you want efficacy, try to really move in the upfront setting because even temozolomide or tumor treating fields in the recurrent setting has not shown to improve outcome. So they have been running in parallel two more trials separate for methylated and for unmethylated patients and uh, looking at adding nivolumab to the standard of care. I don't have the survival curves, although they must be out there somewhere, but we have two press releases that are fully disappointing, showing that it has no effect whatsoever. So unfortunately, negative, that doesn't mean immunotherapy doesn't work, but probably unselected patients, single agent uh, may not be the right approach when it comes to diseases that have a complete different pathogenesis like glioblastoma. The other thing which is um, uh, quite impressive, there are is numerous trials with checkpoint inhibitors out there. Many of them uncontrolled variations on a theme, not sure they're going to inform us on that much. But when you go on what has been out there on checkpoint inhibitors uh, in the literature, you see that the high number of patients are on corticosteroids. And I think if you want to go in immunotherapy, you need to remove the most immunosuppressive drug we have, the corticosteroids, and uh, otherwise you're not going to see an effect. And I think even in the phase three trial I just shown you, there's been a high percentage of patients who have been on, sometimes we call low dose, but even two milligrams of steroids will cause lymphocytopenia is somewhat immunosuppressive. So this should be off. If you want to combine it, at least I often combine it with low dose bevacizumab. Um, low dose means three to five milligrams per kilogram instead of the 10 that has been approved and give it every three to four weeks. And it will allow you to have the great majority of patients off, your steroid, off steroids. This just to remind us 
with every series we look at, patients on steroids have a worse outcome than patients without steroids. And this could be shown in the preclinical model. Um, so it's not only selection, that, that's a mouse model uh, coming out of uh, Eric Holland's lab, uh, showing that steroids also in the mouse are detrimental. Now, after all this negative propaganda on checkpoint inhibitors, we have nevertheless a positive trial. Now, this is an, uh, an important nature medicine paper by uh, Bob Prince and Tim Clausey and uh, collaborators, where they randomized patients with recurrent disease to receiving neoadjuvant uh, pembrolizumab versus uh, surgery first and then the checkpoint inhibitor. And it allowed a lot of uh, correlative science, um, changes in uh, gene expression profile and so on. What however got a lot of attention is their survival curve. Now again, uh, I showed you for BN001 or 005, they need 500 patients. I showed you our trials have always been several hundred patients. And here you have one arm with 19 patients and one arm with 16 patients. I think it's just not enough to really show a comparative survival curve. And this may just be patient selection. So that's, I would kind of caution. Nevertheless, it's very intriguing. I think the principle of looking new adjuvant before you do repeat surgery or even before you do initial surgery, I think something to really keep in mind as a strategy to explore, to learn, and to ultimately improve outcome. What about oncolytic viruses? Another approach that has been investigated and is being investigated in patients in recurrent disease. Uh, the, Mode of action is variable, you know, um, direct uh, oncolytic viruses, but also pre presentation of tumor antigens, stimulation of immune response. So maybe best if combined uh, with some checkpoint inhibitor and other immune modulators. So one example is uh, this virus produced by a company called Xiopharm. It's an, it's an adenovirus that has been genetically modified with the real switch that would allow to turn on and off by giving Validomex um, human IL-12 secretion. And when human IL-12 is secreted by the tumor, you get a lot of inflammation, you get a lot of signaling and attraction of immune cells. So basically trying to make a cold tumor hot. So So this is what has been uh, done. It has been a, a first trial with 31 patients showing that this is possible. We have a better report now by Nino Choka came out uh, in summer of last year showing that you have, you really can induce an immune response, that you have post-treatment a lot of positive immune cells. We have high excretion of uh, secretion of IL-12. And when you have treated patients like this, you, can, uh, you know that they had a lot of inflammation. Sometimes you could not give it every day, the Validimex, because you even needed to uh, slow it down. So the system per cell itself works. On survival, I think, again, in a phase one trial, very difficult to make any survival conclusion. But the next step, what we have done on this trial, and which is ongoing now, or has completed recruitment and awaiting the analysis, has been this strategy combining with a checkpoint inhibitor. And that's also how things will go forward. Just to show you one patient, um, on this, um, David is a 60-year-old gentleman with a left frontal lobe. He had a gross total resection in uh, 2018, went on a clinical trial there. He had a non-methylated tumor, uh, IDH wild type. So kind of your off-the-shelf 
poor prognosis, uh, glioblastoma. He had a recurrence six, eight months later, and uh, he had a secondary section with us and followed with this adenovirus injection plus an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So just to show you uh, the sequence of things, this has been in January, the recurrence before resection, it was hyperperfusing, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't pseudoprogression that would also confirm pathologically afterwards. And this is seven, 11 months further, but actually now we are 16 months post-treatment and 27 months post-diagnosis and not the sign of recurrence. So you would say, oh, this strategy works and it may well work. But what I want to get when we did the second recurrence, we did some more molecular analysis and we actually identified that he has an FGFR 3 tax 3 fusion and these tumors have a different natural history and they have an overall better prognosis. So that explains why this unmethylated tumor actually has a survival of over two years. So our treatment may have an effect, but we also have a different makeup. Also just to warn when we do things and we compare it small numbers with uncontrolled randomized, we need to know more details. Not all tumors are alike, no matter how they look under the microscope. What it also tells us that for this patient, should he once recur, that we would now have uh, FGFR TAC uh, inhibitors that are in clinical trials. And one has also been uh, recently approved, uh, not necessarily for, for glioma, but it is at least on the market. I think it has been approved for cholangiocarcinoma. So that's things, at least we get access to the, uh, to the agent. Now again, do the agents reach the brain in a sufficient concentration? I think that's something we need to address as we do trials in the future, that we do trials and we really look at non-contrast uh, non enhancing tissue to get a dosage to see whether we are really cytotoxic there. Another uh, agent is lavotrectinate for NTRAC inhibitors that has uh, shown some effect and got some lead way and interest in brain tumors with good responses. Again, these tumors are less than 5% of the glioma, but if you don't look, at, uh, look for those ab aberrations, you will not find them. So let me sum up. I think we have plenty of modalities, but we need to work in concert and we need to work together. We need neuroradiology, we need uh, advanced imaging, which I didn't uh, talk about, uh, PET and other ways. Uh, we need them in a team and we need them in a dialogue. Interdisciplinary collaboration, I think you have it in Miami, we have it in Chicago, but that makes the difference when we really want to offer the best possible care to the patient. Care means not only treatment, but also things in synergy, but also knowing when we need to have palliative medicine involved and when we can really address also the goals for the patient. I need to acknowledge lots of this work has been done with my partner in crime. This is a very talented young neurosurgeon, Adam Sonnabend, who um, here was wearing a mask when we were actually traveling the Middle East and seeing one of our patients in Qatar who was on one hour surgical trials before, um, preclinical work that I didn't show you but has been uh, published uh, by Dan Zhang that shows all the preclinical work that was there in order to do the clinical trial with abraxane and ultrasound that we now have up and going. The collaboration with neuropathology, we are spoiled that we have Dan Brad and Craig Robinski and the team and uh, Craig is even part of the Department of Neurosurgery on top of being of Department of uh, Pathology. Denise Schultens and her colleagues as statisticians. We have Chris Amide, an outstanding uh, research nurse with a PhD, uh, understanding and running the show, helping us. David James uh, with all the preclinical model, 
Matt Lesniak, Department Chair of Neurosurgery, uh, outstanding. And then we have radiation, um, radio, neuroradiology. We have uh, people in collabor collaboration help, helping for dosing, also in animal models. This is from uh, Illinois Institute of Technology and our partners in industry. And of course, to acknowledge um, our funds, funding the Malnati Brain Tumor Institute, which is the philanthropy behind our Brain Tumor Institute and our endeavor within the Lurie Cancer Center. And then also philanthropists who have helped to give us the freedom to move forward until we could get the grants and with whom without that support, many things could not have been done. Really want to acknowledge NCI, the SPORE grant we got, the R1 we got, and these are grants uh, Adam Sonnabend got uh, early on in his career. So that's the team uh, it takes to make music in Chicago. If anybody wants to join us, I think for your talented people, we always have uh, space. And otherwise, let's try also across the country to collaborate in order to really make uh, progress in this disease. With that, I want to close. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was an amazing talk on, on some of the latest and greatest and, and very inspiring. So um, let me just ask a few questions here that we have from the crowd and, and that have come in uh, before we get to our panelists. Uh, Rachel Yan was asking specifically about the implanted focus ultrasound device and, and how does that compare over some of the other external devices um, and HIFU, you know, HIFU and, uh, and whatnot. And um, is it something that you could use on recurrence, um, cost, cost correlation and, and things like that? Any comments? Um, I think to talk about cost right now, it's way premature. This is, sure. this is research. I think uh, the most costly treatment is all the treatments we do that don't work. So I think if some, uh, it's, the difference is that we don't have to overcome the skull. So uh, it's much easier. It's a much uh, simpler once it is implanted to do it repeatedly than the external. The, the HIFU with the inside tech device is complex. And it's very precise, which is great. But I think for precision, I have my neurosurgeon and I have my colleagues in, neuro radi uh, in, in radiation oncology who can also get the beam very precise. So I think it has its inherent limitations. It's not one or the other. I think it's both ways should move forward and uh, we learn from each. I think the fact that we can now irradiate large portions of the brain is interesting, uh, not irradiate them, uh, sonicate. Uh, we are now at nine ultrasound emitters. If the concept works, we could even have 18 ultrasound emitters. Uh, I think there would be ways until we have ultimately maybe something that we don't need to implant. But to my knowledge, and I'm not a physicist, to overcome with ultrasound to skull is uh, quite challenging. Great. Uh, Bruno Titopane da Luz uh, asks, why do you think there's not more um, research and clinical trials focused on uh, early identification um, of pre-tumors uh, and understanding kind of why these tumors are happening in the first place with liquid biopsies um, and, and screening the general publication to, to do prevented, preventative cures rather than treating disease after recurrence? So I had two things to it. A is the liquid biopsies is something that we and others do, and I didn't go into that in interest of time in parallel. I think, can we follow, also can we get a response on a liquid biopsy early on, what is happening, whether our treatments are effective. Um, for prevention, similar as screening, that only makes sense when we have good treatments. And even there, uh, prevention is highly disputed, even with uh, even nowadays still with mammography, whether it helps or uh, PSA screen. So we could have uh, day long discussions on those. So I think as long I don't have a good treatment for glioblastoma, I'm not sure I want to come and see you that you let me know that I have two years in advance already misery, knowing that I'm going to uh, succumb to the disease. 
Okay. Um, see, Ernesto uh, talks about uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation in, in the role of recovery for, for glioblastoma. What are your thoughts on, on using this for, for identifying, uh, you know, uh, eloquent areas and also for areas of recovery? I think you guys are better positioned to answer that question than me. My disclaimer at the beginning, I'm just a simple uh, oncologist. Um, and I think, yes, we need to do more. What I alluded to at the beginning, that we don't even look at location in detail, despite all the neurologists we had in the team, I think is a big missed uh, opportunity. And I think we do to do better in the future. And one last question before we get there is, is with all these clinical trials and work, you know that don't profile and look at the sub, the, mud, the the subtypes of tumors, do you think that's going to be the new requirement now? And and if so, how do you know which profiles are important? It seems like every year we're coming out with new subtypes markers um, uh, within within them. And how do you keep track of them as you try to go from one clinical trial to the next in order to understand who is benefiting and who's not? I think here the team comes in. Um, even I can't keep track of all the markers at all times. I think the discussion, um, there is even other issues. It is quality assurance. You always get a result. Is the result reliable? Is it not reliable? Uh, I think with MGMT, there was major work just for a single marker to validate it. And it was validated. Um, we still fight on the technology. I could, uh, again, it was, I purposefully did not go into MGMT, but you know, what you call methylated, unmethylated will depend because there's a gray zone in between what you want to enrich for. So if you want to withhold uh, temozolomide, you have to be more restrictive, what you call unmethylated, than if you want to enrich for methylated ones. So there's all kind of uh, factors that play in. So it's not the same cutoff. Okay, great. Yeah, there's a bunch of other questions, but I want to make sure we have time for our panelists. So, uh, Dimitri, you want to start with uh, your your case and, and talk? There you go. Okay, Mike, thanks so much for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, and uh, what an amazing talk by Dr. Stoop. So it's hard to follow Dr. Stoop uh, in this forum. Uh, but I'll do my best to tell you a little bit about uh, what I do here at NYU. Uh, I'm a brain tumor surgeon at NYU. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the review that was given by uh, Dr. Stoop was really comprehensive and uh, amazing. And congratulations, Dr. Stoop and my friend Adam Sonneband on the uh, innovative work uh, with the um, uh, ultrasound. Um, a couple of disclosures, get that out of the way. Uh, so this is uh, the Dr. Stoops paper from, doc, uh, from 2005 on the concurrent use of temozolomide and radiation, which is the current uh, uh, standard of care for newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Um, and uh, it, it certainly uh, made a difference. Uh, we've been using it here for uh, almost 15 years now. Uh, but when you look, when I started working on glioblastoma, I, I looked back in uh, older literature and I found this amazing paper from um, Montefiore Hospital, actually, here in the Bronx in New York. Uh, it, it goes back to 1949, uh, so 70 years ago. The median survival for glioblastoma was eight months, and now we're up to 16 or so. So we really haven't made very much progress. It's about... Uh, an additional month of survival for every, for every decade of research. Uh, so that underlies how tough this disease is. And, and I recently came across, I was doing some retrospective analysis of uh, patients of mine for a study, and I came across two patients with an essentially identical tumor. Um, and both of those tumors end up being IDH12 type MGMT methylated glioblastoma. So this is a 64-year-old gentleman um, who presented with gait imbalance of behavioral changes. He had a right, uh, a right temporal tumor, a large one, uh, conducive to aggressive surgery. Uh, we take it out. Uh, as you see, the diagnosis was IDH12 type MGMT methylated glioblastoma and he got hemozolomide and radiation. He's doing great four years later. Next month will be four years actually. 
Uh, he has some, now he's developed in the past few months, some uh, subtle progression in um, uh, the ependema of the right lateral ventricle, uh, but clinically he's doing great. Uh, and uh, this is a tale of two tumors that look identical in MRI, but they're biologically very, very different. This is a 72-year-old female uh, who presented with confusion, and the MRI showed uh, a near identical tumor as the prior one in the right temporal lobe in an area conducive to aggressive surgery. Uh, and we get a gross lower resection and um, this is a more recent case where we made use of intraoperative MRI and 5 ALA at our institution. We're lucky to have these technologies. Um, and we get a gross lower resection, but uh, despite her being IDH wild type and uh, MGMT methylated and therefore expected to respond very well to uh, oculating agents, she was treated with radiation and timozolomide, but uh, about six months later, uh, she developed, developed diffuse uh, ependymal leptomeningeal spread of her tumor uh, and passed away. So uh, it's a, a tale of two tumors that look identical on MRI, and they're both expected to respond well to chemotherapy, uh, but they behave uh, very, very differently, the one from the other. And uh, it points out how little we understand about the biology of these tumors. Uh, so from my perspective, I know as a surgeon that no matter how good surgery is, and no matter how much technology we add to the surgery, uh, we will never cure these patients uh, with just surgery alone, as Dr. Stoop said. Uh, and unfortunately, we still don't understand the biology very well. Uh, as a surgeon, what I think about uh, when I do surgery for glioblastoma is I try to achieve maximal uh, safe site reduction. We take out as much tumor as we can safely, but we're aware that we can't cure anybody uh, doing surgery alone. And I try to reduce mass effect. But as a scientist, uh, I try to understand the biology uh, of glioblastoma to try to make a difference in the care. Uh, so I want to tell you, show you a couple of slides about some of the work that my laboratory uh, is doing. Uh, the past few years, we've been working on um, a class of proteins that we find very interesting for several reasons. Uh, but these proteins are, belong to the family of G-protein coproreceptors. G-protein coproreceptors uh, represent one of the largest protein families uh, with about a thousand different members. Uh, and they are transmembrane proteins and they couple to uh, so-called G-proteins that entrain signaling mechanisms within the cell. So these, these proteins transduce extracellular signals uh, like ligands or stimuli and initiate signaling mechanisms inside the cell. Within this uh, family of uh, proteins, uh, there's a subfamily called adhesion G-protein coproreceptors. And those adhesion G-protein coproreceptors serve a very long extracellular end terminus. And the past few years, uh, we came across one member of this adhesion G protein cover receptor family called GPR133 uh, that looks like this. This is a cartoon showing the membrane topology and domains of the protein. Uh, and we become very interested in it. Uh, and one of the reasons, I'll show you a couple of the main reasons why, why we're interested in it. This is um, a putative structure of this protein. But uh, GPR133 is not expressed in a normal brain, uh, including areas where um, the ependymal area of the ventricular system where progenitor cells uh, are located. I should say related to one of the questions that came up earlier, uh, these progenitor cells may be a cell of origin for glioblastoma. Um, but when we studied the expression of this protein, GPR133, uh, we see it come on more and more as gliomas um, uh, go from grade one to grade four. So it's expressed in all glioblastomas that we've looked at. Um, and uh, within glioblastoma, it's expressed in um, 
within the core of the tumor, but also in the infiltrative edge of the tumor where the tumor invades the brain. This is a cardinal biological behavior of glioblastoma that, as Dr. Stoop said, precludes surgical cure. Um, so uh, the expression profile within the brain is favorable for targeting this protein. It's sort of, it's de novo expressed in these tumors, essentially. Um, I'm trying to advance. Uh, but Click on the presentation. Click on the screen on the presentation and then, and then advance. Hold on a second, I'm trying to do that. Oh, here. Okay, and, and uh, when, you, when we look functionally at what this protein does, there was very little known about this protein um, before we started our studies. Uh, we used a technology called uh, knockdown where we uh, experimentally can drive down expression of the protein in the tumor cells. Uh, these are patient derived tumor cells. So here you can see an experiment where in the control experiment, we put patient derived glioblastoma cells in the mouse brain and they form a tumor. The green cells are uh, human glioblastoma cells growing in the mouse brain. But in the control, ex in, the, in the experimental condition where we bring down expression of this protein in the tumor cells, the, um, the human cells cannot form tumors anymore. Uh, and this is the mouse experiment summarized here and the mice that have the um, control, the uh, uh, human cells that have expression of this protein, they die. But the mice implanted with cells that don't have this protein, uh, they keep going because they don't form tumors. And this parallels what we see in humans. So when we take the cancer genome atlas database of GBM patients, and dichotomize the patients by expression of this protein, expression the, of the mRNA encoding this protein actually, uh, we see that the high expressors in red live shorter than the low expressors in blue. So this suggests that this protein helps the tumor uh, grow and uh, perhaps be more aggressive. Uh, how do we use that information? And so we, we, in my laboratory, we do a lot of basic biology to try to understand how this protein works. Um, uh, uh, but from the translational point of view, um, we uh, tried a couple of years ago to uh, generate small molecule inhibitors and we were not successful in finding specific inhibitors. But right now, what we're trying to do is develop biologics. What does that mean? This is antibodies or related uh, molecules such as monobodies, for example. They recognize the long extracellular domain of this protein, uh, which is uh, uh, predicted to be highly antigenic. And we're collaborating with researchers here at my institution to develop uh, either neutralizing antibodies or uh, think about the concept of antibody drug conjugates. So an antibody that recognizes the, the protein and without having any specific function on the activity of the protein, it just uh, carries a, um, a poison, a drug that um, uh, kills the cell. And we've recently have become interested in a related protein uh, called CD97 that seems to have a similar expression profile, not expressed in the brain and expressed in glioblastoma de novo. And that's a protein that was studied actually by the late Andy Parsa uh, at UCSF and uh, Northwestern um, in glioblastoma. So we're, we're trying to further the work of Andy Parsa a little bit. And um, uh, we think it may be interesting as much as GPR-133. Uh, one of the other things we're doing in my laboratory is uh, looking at one of the future directions of basic research that Dr. Stu pointed out, the epigenome. The epigenome refers to not just changes in, in the DNA sequence, mutations, uh, but um, changes that relate to um, uh, proteins that bind the DNA uh, or the organization, the three-dimensional organization of the genome that affect gene expression. These are some of the concepts that I just alluded to as epigenetic um, uh, modifiers of gene expression. 
chromatin looping, three-dimensional nuclear organization, and enhancer promoter interactions that may underlie glioma initiation and progression. Uh, and I'm going to get, I'm not going to get into that because it becomes a little esoteric trying to explain it, but um, we uh, have found that in the initiation of uh, IDH mutant glioma, uh, there are changes in how chromatin, the, the DNA of cells, loops. Um, and this looping is essential uh, to uh, gene expression, several uh, genes that are crucial to oncogenesis and glioma uh, depend on this appropriate chromatin looping and where this this chromatin looping is dysregulated as happens in glioma initiation. Uh, certain genes are turned off and other genes are turned on uh, and that can promote the oncogenic transformation of a progenitor cell in the brain. Um, some of the analytic tools that we have to understand um, chromatin uh, organization, chromatin looping are shown here. Uh, it, it's a little esoteric, so I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not gonna uh, try to explain it, uh, but it's, it's, it looks kind of cool. Uh, it's nice to show. Uh, but these are some of the things uh, we do in the laboratory. So uh, we try to understand biology as much as possible, and we uh, try to be thoughtful about what we take from the laboratory to try to bring to potential clinical trials. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to stop here and thank my, my lab and our many collaborators, uh, but also uh, uh, folks that um, help with our clinical work and uh, the folks at the Brain and Spine Tumor Center here at NYU. Thanks so much. That was that was really great work that you guys are doing, and uh, it's uh, ironic because I was uh, with Andy while he did that work at UCSF at C97, and, and we're actually working on C97 a little bit in my lab, so we should talk a little bit later. <laughs> yeah, good, absolutely. Uh, perfect, perfect. Um, Pilara, uh, we can switch to some cases now. I know Pilara has um, some cases for Dr. Stoop. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just how do I do hope that? the cases are for all of us. Yes, they are. Yeah. You could just uh, share your screen. If not. Oh, okay. Hold on. Okay. In the meantime, for the ones I saw there are a few more questions on uh, in the chat. I just made a photo of the chat, so I'll try to reach out to you with uh, Michael's help to find your emails and, and respond later. Perfect. Thank you. Hello everybody, I am um, Maria del Pilar Guillermo Prieto Ivel, for short, Pilar Prieto. I am um, one of the neuro-oncologists here at the University of Miami. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the invitation. And thank you, Dr. Stoop, for such a great talk and for all the contributions that you've made in the glioblastoma world. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's great to hear you talk and you know, to actually meet the person uh, that, you know, that has revolutionize the, the treatment for glioblastoma. So um, I am presenting an, um, an interesting case of uh, HGK27M diffuse midline glioma. Uh, this is a 49-year-old uh, Caucasian man with uh, uh, HGK27M diffuse midline glioma of the cervical spine, cervical thoracic spine. Uh, onset of symptoms started in uh, August 2019 with right arm weakness and pain, and he attributed to injury of uh, you know his arm while he was working. He's a contractor. Um, uh, MRI on oh, on January third, twenty twenty, he had a right hemicord expansal intramedullary infiltrating process, which we can see this uh, a large lesion, and uh, and had some patchy enhancements. Uh, he underwent um, biopsy, and the biopsy showed, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, was consistent with a diffuse midline glioma. He completed radiation therapy on the spine on April 5th, 2020. And then a month later, uh, the MRI showed significant edema concerning of necrosis with probable progression. So you can see how it you know, fills up the, the, the spinal canal. Uh, he was started, um, interestingly, despite the, how horrible his, his spinal cord looked, 
uh, he was still ambulatory. He had mostly right-sided uh, symptoms with spasticity and neuropathy, neuropathic pain. But uh, throughout the summer, he was able to renovate his own bathroom and make it look um, uh, like a magazine, uh, you know, like one of those like really pretty bathrooms accessible for handicap you know, in preparation of you know, what may come later. So this is uh, four weeks after radiation th uh, therapy. He was placed on high dose steroids, and um, and we were trying to get him on the compassionate use of uh, on 201. Uh, but you know, just like around the time they closed, and um, and the trial uh, available for him uh, here in Miami for on 201 was temporarily closed uh, for enrollment too. So uh, he he was started on on bevacizumab on June 30th. Uh, he so far he has received four doses. The last one was on, sep on September 9th. Uh, he also received two cycles of Temodar, and uh, and on August 7th he had a cervical spine MRI, which showed improved edema, and uh, and and the enhancement was better, probably because of the vasting. And at that time, he reported some vision changes um, for which I ordered MRI. Uh, then, you know, later the patient said it was just dry eye, so, but, but I kept the MRI. Uh, cyst, cervical spine on September 5th showed disease progression. It was uh, a, a caudal extension from the tumor, uh, you know, from T1 to T3. Uh, the patient was mildly symptomatic from it and just a little more spasticity and more difficulty moving the right leg, but not a significant change from his baseline. And based on these changes, I, uh, I was able to, to, to get him in contact with the, with the team for ONC 201 here. These are the images from um, May, May, uh, May 7th, and then to, you know, from, from, um, you know, from August 7th, and then to September 5th, you can see how the tumor feels in the, the spinal canal, especially in this area here. So, um, you know, so then you know, in the meantime, he also got the MRI of the, of the brain and we can see that there's new, multiple new uh, T2 flare lesions you know, in the corpus callosum, in the brain stem, in the cerebellum. And, um, and in the right left temporal lobe and, uh, and in the medulla oblongata. So, and also there's like some cerebellar lesions that were tracking um, in the, uh, you know, in the cerebellum, like, like in this area here, it looked like possible leptomeningeal uh, disease. And none of these lesions uh, uh, were, en were enhancing. And, this, and these lesions are not symptomatic either. Uh, he next day he presented to, uh, this is the, sp the cervical spine uh, you know, that was done and it showed the st stable changes from what it was noticed before and um, and the involvement of the of the brainstem right here. On um, September 19th, he presented to the hospital with acute uh, lower extremity weakness, united retention, and bowel incontinence. He had a lumbar spine MRI and showed a new lesion in T12, which is not enhancing. Uh, he was admitted and started on high dose hexamethasone and, um, and started um, emergent radiation therapy. Uh, on the exam, he has um, an old right Horner syndrome from May 2020. Uh, I would just like to mention in back in May, he also had a brain MRI and the brain MRI was clean. Uh, on his exam now, his, uh, the rest of the cranial nerves are intact. Uh, he has uh, a, a right upper extremity weakness and spasticity, which is stable from prior. But the new changes were that he had a lower bilateral lower extremity weakness, much worse on right and left, and, uh, and had a new sensory level at T12, and um, in addition to the prior sensory level he had, and the new um, urinary and bowel symptoms. Um, with high dose steroids, he recovered a little bit of, of movement, and uh, uh, today he, you know, he he was able to to, you know, to to give like a four out of five um, 
uh, strength in effort you know, to the examiner today. And, um, and, because, and because of the possible uh, leptomeningeal disease, he's no longer eligible for ONC-201. Now, we did CSF analysis, which is spending for cytolo the cytology spending, um, you know, in, in the hopes that you know, he may be able to be um, a candidate for this trial. Uh, so with this, uh, you know, with this challenging case and this challenging tumor itself, uh, you know, we know that ONC-201 does not cross the blood-brain barrier, so there's an unclear benefit uh, if he does have leptomeningeal spread of the disease. Um, on 206, uh, you know, it seems that it crosses the blood brain barrier, so that might be a possibility, but it's not uh, available yet. Um, no mustin alone or in combination with Avastin uh, might be a possibility, or, and, or potential role of immunotherapy with, uh, along with Avastin plus minus uh, radiation to the brain. Uh, we're currently holding radiation to the brain until symptomatic, until the patient becomes symptomatic because of the concern of, uh, of inflammation and necrosis, and then you know, we accelerate you know, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the disease process and you know, potentially be locked in. Um, so you know, with, ha with that, uh, having said that, uh, you know, with, uh, Dr. Stubb, with your experience, uh, you know, do, you, you know, do you have any, any recommendations you know, to treat this patient better? Uh, even you know, maybe maybe a potential role for uh, tumor treating fields for the intracranial disease. I'm, I'm glad you're keeping it very simple, Pilar. Um, <laughs> this is a very challenging case. So when uh, Michael and uh, Ricardo uh, reached out to me whether I would give a seminar, of course they didn't tell me that they're going to uh, challenge me to that point. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to probably have to disappoint you. I think I agree with all what you have said. And the truth is there is no good solution. So maybe just a few considerations. I think probably nothing will work. I'm not sure we have any data supporting temozolomide in K27M uh, mutated tumors. I would probably also have given it just uh, short of something better but uh, it's a concern, especially when you have sometimes less aggressive tumors and you combine it. And here you don't, for once, don't wanna to have too much inflammation or radiation necrosis. So that's just to be uh, considered. I think uh, CCNU will also, I think it probably it's the, the next line to give and it crosses the blood brain barrier, but very unlikely that it will really help. Um, onc 2 would be the right thing. Now, the difference between ONC-206 and uh, Temodar is ONC-206, we don't yet know that it doesn't work, while for Temodar, we do. So uh, you, you work on the hope. That's why you have those investigation agents and clinical trials. Uh, and you need to find altogether ways that for patients like this, there is access to the drug one way or another. You know, I think cost came up repeatedly. But what we're doing here, trying everything under the sun, uncontrolled, that's the costly part for this. We, uh, and I, you know, an outside COVID patient could travel somewhere, so there must be ways. Now, uh, you know the story for Oncocytics. This is a very small biotech. They don't have the resources to, uh, to really provide the drug. We have the same issue that the drugs are not available in Europe at all without funding. So there, this we have to, see and we have to run the trials with less overhead. The thing you mentioned, and you mentioned immunotherapy, always comes up. Um, I think if you want to do more and there is the strive for more, that's probably of the unknown, which has probably the, lo the longest benefit, potential benefit. Um, I would probably then combine it or, and give immunotherapy before I give radiation to the brain, uh, just for this idea of abscopal effect. Now, it's always talked about this abscopal effect. It's always the same people who have seen it. I'm still waiting to see it. I've given years ago radiation plus checkpoint inhibitor and even Avastin to avoid the steroids and, and B radiation. All of that, uh, I couldn't pan out an effect. 
but at least in the lab it works and there are individual uh, case reports. Um, now, if you have to be careful with the resources, I think probably the best resources at the end in palliative care and, and less is more. I, I remember it was young, but I don't remember the age of the patient. But 49. How much? 49. 49. Um, but of course, people don't want to hear that. But I think early on to have a discussion what matters to their life, what is important. Um, it's also what is important that they, the family doesn't end up with medical bills that will have them suffer for the next 20 years. So uh, all these kind of considerations. But a good solution, I don't have you, you mentioned it all. So it's all kind of considerations. Um, Dr. Stoop, um, there, there's like just a preclinical um, study of, uh, of alternating electric fields in, um, in vitro for you know, diffuse uh, glioma cells. I mean, this, this, um, uh, diffuse spontane glioma cells. And you know, it seems that there's like some uh, positive effect you know, from tumor treating fields in, in stopping these cells from growing. Um, do you potentially see uh, you know, a use for uh, Optum in, in this case? So you could, Novocure tells me that they have now ways even for pontine uh, infratectorial uh, location. Now again, you have disseminated disease. So you're going to treat where the fire is the highest. The effect, it takes usually months. So it's, it's, I would not have come up with, I would not be against. I'm sure Novocure will support you as much as they can. But again, how much do we really gain uh, when you can't cover the whole field with the spine? That's why I didn't put it high on my list. Yeah. I take the data on tumor treating fields now outside this K27M mutation, which I think at least from what we know, the mutational status does not really matter. It's probably more the, two, the size of the cells that will matter and how strong the field you can get than the genetics, at least at the current understanding. Um, but in recurrent disease, um, EF11, tumor treating field had no significant effect. You know, you could see some kind of efficacy with a little higher response rate, but it did not prolong overall survival. Um, so that's one of the reasons I would use it up front uh, early on. But here, I don't think this makes much, I would not fight for this patient with tumor treating fields when you have, when you cannot cover everything with the field. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. I truly really appreciate your, your input. Right. Okay. And just, I know we're, we're at time here, but I'll just, my, my case is much more uh, straightforward. Um, I hope so. Uh, and just kind of brings up some of the, the, the points that you made earlier. This is a, a patient of both mine and Pilar, actually, a 63-year-old that presented um, a couple months ago with his first-time seizure. Very, very small enhancement in the right uh, frontal lobe and with surrounding flare. Um, so he had an a, a aggressive resection, including the flare signal around the enhancement, and the, the biopsy came back as the GBM, IDH wild type, MGMT non-methylated. Um, and here's the rest of the, the, the information. His KI-67 was extremely high at 30%. So we were ready to start um, you know, the, the STU protocol. And uh, three and a half weeks later on his uh, MRI getting ready for radiation, he had a sizable recurrence that was larger, much larger than the initial tumor. Um, and I've seen this now probably about three or four times in the last five years. And so the question at this point is, is you know, uh, and maybe I'll start with Dimitri, is, is what would you do in this situation? Um, would you go back in and re-resect or is it cat out of the bag and is it just time to move on quickly to uh, adjuvant therapy? Uh, yeah, very interesting case. Uh, it, it, it would be, is the patient symptomatic now with this, with this recurrence or not? No, not symptomatic. Doing well. Yeah, it would be a tough sell because you, um, uh, you would still have to wait a, a few weeks before starting therapy for things to heal up. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what the right answer here, here is. Um, it, one of my questions was, uh, related to the pathology, you said 
um, the H3K K27 trimethyl immunostain, uh, what, did you mean K27 methine, M? K27 M shows focal loss or? No, I think you read a different subtype of that. But. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, it, it would be a tough sell to um, uh, re resect uh, because what are you going to do differently? Um, but you may have to. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, is the is the tumor MGMT methylated or not? No, no not methylated. Yeah, uh, 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 it would be tough. I guess you can try to re resect, but um, try to expedite uh, the therapy, subsequent therapy. Is there multifocal disease there? Uh, is there? It was in, it was congruency, and then these other two spots on the flare were not uh, disease; they were just uh, for due to age. So yeah, so we had a long discussion about this. We had we he was, uh, you know, I think that the three and a half weeks may have been actually four weeks because we were trying to get him into a clinical trial that we had here um, and wasn't quite ready yet, uh, and and there was also some delay with him even starting the therapy because of um, within the next couple of days because of his insurance was changing. And so because of that, we talked to the patient, we ended up to proceed uh, with another resection. Um, and I'll get Dr. Stoops uh, kind of in, uh, opinion after this. So another resection, he did well. Um, again, a very aggressive, uh, got the flare signal, got the enhancement. Uh, and then he was then started on, uh, he wasn't eligible at that point for any trials. Uh, he was then um, underwent uh, the standard protocol uh, and now presents three months later uh, after this, uh, after completing therapy with progression of disease. However, the perfusion scan shows uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not as impressive, but obviously with the extent of flare signal, there's additional mass effect and more enhancement. It's likely um, uh, progression. So uh, that just kind of brings me to the question of, of you know, when you look at that, uh, I, I want to know what, what Dr. Stu's uh, idea is, is, is early, again, surgery, would, would he recommend surgery in this case? And then this idea of, uh, of survival impact on the initiation of chemo radiation after resection of tumor, you know, uh, both myself and Andy Parsa and the rest of the UCSF group actually kind of published at the same time on this. And, and there was some findings that actually four to six weeks after surgery was kind of this best time point and whether that's related to the steroid tapering uh, or not, uh, in this case actually doesn't fall into that window because it progressed quickly. But, you know, weighing all those thoughts, I just want to want to see what, what, what Dr. Stoops recommendations would be. So challenging again, I think I would agree with what you have done. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, with that regrowth, just in order to be able to deliver radiation, not have mass effect uh, during radiation and so on, I think it made sense to re-resect. And then as uh, Dimitri has said, you know, make sure that you already lined up that you can uh, 10 days later start with radiation. Now, as, again, as a general, but we should not generalize this. It's usually not, you know, those cases where we have to start radiation immediately and cannot wait the three or four weeks, it's not going to make that. It's not uh, if you would have started already, it would not make a difference. When you're not, when you want to get the resources for a new MRI machine, then we will say, uh, for a new uh, radiation machine, we will say that it matters. But when we looked at, and our Australian colleagues looked at, and uh, even the big trials, we had a median of close to four weeks after. It didn't make a big difference. So. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to wait, but uh, this, uh, if it would have been an MGMT methylated tumor, I may have advocated to start with, uh, with chemo first. Sure. And uh, sometimes, again, it's different in our big centers, but if I would be somewhere in the woods and I, it takes a while until I get, get the patient to radiation have a methylated tumor, um, I'll, uh, I think it's fair enough to start with temozolomide kind of neoadjuvant. We've looked at this at some point, whether there's any advantage of giving temozolomide in a neoadjuvant setting. It is not because we don't get enough responses. It's not like breast cancer is chemo chemosensitive and they get com pathological complete response or even had a neck tumors. So that's, uh, so that's why it's not a 
something to mm. as a pattern, but for methylated ones, you can get it quite a bit and you could talk on that. This is a poor prognosis patient. I don't know what this molecular histone chains will help us at, with today's knowledge. Uh, hopefully we learn more uh, in the future. I think, but likely prognostically poor. But again, of the different cases, also things which have been uh, discussed, also the uh, cases Dimitri has presented before, um, the high variability we have, but you know, you said it's a high proliferation index, 30% is surely high, but I've seen 60, 70% and I don't have had this kind of regrowth. Um, Dimitri also sh showed the case which was over 70 and uh, actually was doing reasonably well. I think this uh, kind of super depressed attitude on people who are over 65 to not do anything uh, is probably not, not the right approach. I think MGMT remains the best predictor for outcome, not on everybody, but, uh, but we start learning the ones who are having a better outcome than predicted by MGMT methylated. These were exactly the ones which has this uh, FGF, uh, FGFR tax refusion. Uh, so all the others actually, it, uh, it works. And I think somebody was asking earlier, you know, how we integrate all the molecular uh, so we have better prediction where it's worth to invest or not. And also where we have to do, take, and we should take more risk because there's nothing to lose. And what we didn't talk about, all the ones we should de-escalate and sometimes do less, especially on the lower grades that we could fill another seminar on just that. Uh, when you have patients who live 10, 15, 20 years, uh, and we do everything now, so nobody can complain that we haven't done enough, but, somebody, uh, but it's the patient afterwards who has to carry the consequences. So even though it's the exception. So, it's a fine balance. Well, um, you know, what would, would it be your recommendation as the next step forward you know, for treatment for these patients? Uh, you know, you know, he's, you know, he progresses by you know, the you know, standard of care. You know, uh, you know, my plan was you know, to put him on a Bastin and Lomustin in combination, trying to give him a, a, you know, like a more powerful, uh, uh, like a synergistic effect. Uh, you know, I don't so what know. I, I think, fair enough. Again, do I know? I can only give you my gestalt and, and my way of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, on data, I would say, you know, don't, uh, do less. Um, but I have had those patients as well. So sometimes I make, go back to a Herlinger's paper in Germany who combined temozolomide and lomastin. Now he did it on MGMT methylated ones. And I'm not sure that there was a true benefit out of the trial. What he has been hiding in the supplement is the true and intent to treat, not the modified intent to treat, which was no difference. But what he has clearly shown is overall it can be done safely. So I've been using that on an unmethylated when I have nothing to lose. And I feel rather than giving temozolomide first and then lumastin, I throw everything in upfront and then I'm more restrictive what I do at recurrence. You've been mentioning bevacizumab repeatedly. I would use bevacizumab generously by putting the indication. As long I have reassured myself with Michael that he doesn't want to do more surgery and the wound is fine, but I never give 10 milligrams per kick. I give three to five as mentioned it's a perfect, it's much better than steroid. And I think there was one of the questions in the chat asked, you know, uh, uh, bevacizumab and its cost and so on and steroid. I think uh, we should have developed bevacizumab instead of steroids at the low dose, at the frequency needed, and it's much less toxic, less infection and so on. So that's when I would use it. Now, again, if you have a patient you want to get on clinical trials and so on, it's a different story. But here we talk now, not as researchers, but we talk as physicians, when I have to come up outside the clinical trial consideration, what is the best for my patient uh, to gain quality time. Great. 
Uh, uh, Mike, can I ask a question? Yeah. Did the pathology, did those markers change uh, in your second surgery? You did that focal loss of uh, uh, the H3K27 trimethyl uh, is is very interesting. That's a, that's the loss. That's a chromatin modification that you see in K27M, the methionine mutation. It just poisons the K27 trimethylation. Uh, and um, in a perfect world, I think this tumor is probably treatable with um, uh, inhibitors of the 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 activating chromatin marks, but, but that's a long story. I, I was just curious whether there was any change between the original and the second pack, but there wasn't. Yeah, no, there wasn't, there wasn't, but thank you. Good point. I think looking also, you know, don't believe all the molecular markers, double check uh, who has done it. I always write which lab has uh, attested X and Y, I think, uh, and then looking that's where the field is going. I took it for the FGFR uh, uh, tag, but you could look uh, on NTRAC. Um, there are other compounds out there, uh, some proven to be effective, some is less, pro uh, less proven, but at least the mechanism. Right. Well, uh, I just want to say thank you again to everybody. We're, we're over time, and I don't want to keep anybody too late. I know everybody's got many, many things to do, but. I greatly, really appreciate uh, Dr. Stoop. Uh, everything that you said tonight was amazing. I'm gonna make sure all the residents and fellows watch this over and over again as many times as we can get them. Uh, and Demetrius and, and Pilar, also thank you for the great cases and insight. Uh, please everybody stay safe and, uh, and we'll see you here next week. Thank you very much, thank you. pleasure. Thank you very much. Having me. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you. Bye.